Hi, welcome. We are going to be talking today about discipline in foster care. And as you can see from the title, it says managing our behaviors to manage theirs. Part of what we're going to be talking about today is how our own experiences and our own history of being parented might influence how we think about discipline. My name is Tracy Schreibels. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm also endorsed in infant and early childhood mental health. I am the executive director and a therapist at Ellison Center, which is a nonprofit mental health agency in the St. Cloud area. I'm excited to be with you today. Part of our time learning today will include me talking and using some slides. I'll be sharing some videos as well as giving you some time to stop and reflect. I might even encourage you to take some stretch breaks throughout as we know that sometimes learning requires us to move around a little bit. Our topic for today includes reviewing a very brief impact on the trauma of children or impact that trauma has on children, using a reflective lens to understand our part in parenting, and learning to understand and respond to behaviors exhibited by the children in your care, along with some trauma-informed discipline strategies that you can begin using. So I want you to take a moment to take to picture this. I want you to sell, think about taking a, a bath towel out of the dryer, and I'm going to ask you to fold it the right way. Oftentimes when I ask people to do this, I see some smiles or I see people look at each other because there's many right ways to fold a bath towel. And there's many things that impact why we might fold it that way. One of the biggest ones might be, how did our parents teach us to fold it? Might also be, what size or space is it going into? Maybe as my partner has taught me a new way to do it. Maybe I went to a hotel and saw a really cool way of folding towels. Maybe just the size of my shelf only allows me to put them in one way or to maximize the space. The reason that we're talking about towels right now is because just like discipline, there's many things that impact the way that we do it, including how we were raised and what we were taught as we were growing up. So a couple of definitions. The first one is about the word foster. The word foster means to help someone grow and develop, taking care of someone's needs. So foster parents are people other than a child's biological parents who are giving that child a place, a safe place to live and grow. Notice that it doesn't say teaching the child everything they need to know or making sure that they behave correctly in every single situation. It really is about coming alongside of somebody wherever they're at and helping them grow and develop. So then some people will ask, what do we know that kids need um, in order to be successful, in order to have their developmental outcomes be the best they can be? I, I bolded some of the most important ones that he, on here that we'll be talking about today, including unconditional love from a family. They need to develop self-confidence and self-esteem. They need many opportunities to play. They need supportive caretakers. They need safe and secure surroundings and appropriate guidance and discipline, part of what we'll be talking about today. So if we know that kids know those things, what gets in the way? What gets in the way of doing those things for, that we know kids need? These are just some of the things that parents have shared about what makes it difficult to, to meet the needs of parents, such as their own stress, their own work situation, maybe finances, maybe other family pressures. Um, maybe there's more than one child and the demands of each child can sometimes be in conflict with what the other one needs. We know that parenting is a very complex task to do. And so while we want kids to have their needs met, we also know that sometimes things might get in the way. So as we continue in our definitions, what is behavior? Behavior is the way in which one conducts oneself or the way in which something such as a machine behaves or anything that a living being does that involves action and response to stimulation. So this is much more thinking about like when I put my key in my car and turn it, it's such as a behavior, right? I put the key in, I turn it, I expect that car to start. So behavior in itself is neither positive or negative. It's neither appropriate or inappropriate. It's just literally a response to a stimuli. For example, feeling hungry when your stomach growls. That might be the type of a behavior that we're talking about. So oftentimes when we're talking about needing to discipline kids, it's because they are engaging in what we consider to be challenging behaviors. So if we look at the definition of challenging, we will see that it says difficult in a way that is usually interesting or enjoyable that might arouse competitive interest, thought, or action, and can be invitingly provocative. So if we were to add the words challenging and behavior together, I wonder if we would agree with these definitions, such as the way one someone behaves that we find difficult in a way that is interesting or enjoyable. 
or the way that someone conducts oneself that arouses my competitive interest, thought, or action that is invitingly provocative. I used to be a preschool teacher at a Head Start program in St. Cloud and came to find out, early, find out early in my career that I actually found challenging behaviors to be kind of interesting. I was curious about them. I wanted to know what made sense. Why is this child engaging in this behavior? And so I know not all of us find behavior or identify behaviors challenging, but the important part is that we as the adults and the caregivers are making an assumption. We are making um, the decision to decide that something is challenging or upsetting or frustrating. Behavior in itself is just behavior. And our job as the adults is to stay curious. And what do I mean by curiosity? Having a strong desire to know or to learn something. So if we think about this, why would using our curiosity about a child help us? Sometimes what I find is that when we slow down and we are curious about a behavior or we are thinking, why, why is the child cho choosing to do this? What are they thinking will happen as a result of this? It really allows us then to think about what has their past experience been? What about their age or development might be contributing to this? What about my own reactions are contributing to this reaction too? And we're going to be talking about more of those things today as we go along in this training. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on these questions. How did you feel about being disciplined as a child? So think back to when you were a child and you were, you were your caregivers, caregivers may have disciplined you. How did you feel about that? Maybe a memory is coming up. Maybe some thoughts about what you remember saying, I'm never going to do this to my kids might come up. There might be things that you think, oh, as a child, I didn't understand that. But looking back, that makes more sense. Then it's also helpful to think about in what ways do you discipline or plan to discipline children differently than how you were disciplined? So again, taking a little bit of time just to reflect and think on this. It's not too often we have this, the luxury to think. So I'm just going to give you a little space. Hopefully that let you give some time just to let those thoughts um, start stirring up and get, get brought up on your mind so that we can use them today as we're thinking together. So when we think about discipline versus punishment, sometimes people want to use these words interchangeably and they actually aren't the same thing. So discipline is really about helping a child learn to solve a problem. Whereas punishment is kind of thinking about wanting a child to suffer for a problem or something that they have done. So if we want to raise a generation of problem solvers and people who can figure things out, we have to focus on solutions and not retribution. So definition of punishment is the suffering, pain, or loss inflicted to get even with someone who has participated in wrongdoing. So for example, if somebody has done something to upset us, we might want to get back at them or get even with them. Or if they said something mean to us, we want to, might want to say something mean back to them. This also implies a threat or a use of power, maybe fear to change inappropriate behavior. It really relies on external force and is designed to stop a behavior. And while we might want that behavior to stop, we oftentimes don't want it to be because a child is afraid of us. We want it to be because it's the right thing to do or because it's the right way to treat other people. So some examples of punishment might include physical or verbal abuse or yelling or, or name calling. It might be withholding rewards or affection. It can also have, be putting penalties out for certain behaviors. So if we shift then and think about discipline, discipline is really about guiding and teaching. It's about training, molding, correcting, and it's about improving moral character. So disciples are identified as students of a teacher. They listen and watch the teacher in order to learn from them. So discipline is really about teaching. It's really about modeling for children how we want them to handle emotions or how to handle their upsets or their frustrations. This is really about helping them learn to maintain self-control and self-reliance. Um, wanting them to make decisions that are appropriate for the, great, for the greater good at times. So you might be able to hear that difference between punishment and discipline. And we're focused today on discipline, about teaching and come on, coming alongside of people in their growth. So I'd like you to imagine this. Put yourself in this situation as a, a way to identify how a child might feel. Let's say that you started a new job and you've been there for about three days. And you aren't sure if you are completing a particularly 
a particular task correctly, even though somebody has previously gone over it with you. So you've been trained in on it, and now they're asking you to do it on your own, and you're not quite sure if you're doing it right. How would you feel if your boss or coworker responded in these ways? Such as you ask your boss and they say, I'm too busy, just leave me alone. Or maybe you ask the person next to you and they say, oh, we already told you how to do this. Maybe you just can't handle this job. Or maybe you ask the person next to you and they say, hey, it took me forever to get this one straight when I was new, I'll review it with you. Or you ask your boss and they say, how can I help you? What do you need? Can you, can you feel the difference? I use this example because I think sometimes when kids are coming to live in our home, especially if they're kids that are we've never met before, it's kind of like they're starting a new job and they have a new boss and we are there to help them learn how to be in this environment and how things work here, just like it has been when you've started a new job in the past. So we're required to talk about why we don't use physical punishment with children in foster care. And for one, it's against the law. We're actually not allowed to. But we also know that physical punishment doesn't work very well for any parent parenting a child. So physical acts like spanking or swatting or slapping can also be triggers for painful memories. And children are less likely to trust somebody that they're afraid of or that they think will hurt them. It can also be a reminder to them of past experience that they have had and can be re-traumatizing for them. Note that timeouts or having a child go away and be by themselves can also be a trigger for some kids, especially kids who have experienced some abandonment or isolation or have been shamed in the past. We also know that in general, physical punishment is very ineffective at modifying behavior because it doesn't help teach a child the new skills or what we want them to do instead. It only tells them what we don't want them to do. It can also reinforce undesired behaviors. I have parents that I work with sometimes who talk about wanting to use spanking or that maybe they were spanked as a child and um, we're thinking about that together. And sometimes we'll talk to parents and say, so if your child hits another person and then you spank them for hitting, can you see how confusing that might be for a child? Because we just told them not to hit, but then we hit them. So like I said, we know that in general, physical punishment is actually very ineffective at changing behavior in ways that we really want to change them. And as a foster parent, you're just not allowed to use them. There are actually statutes about this that say that um, no child shall be subject to corporal punishment or emotional abuse, such as the non-accidental infliction of physical, physical pain on a child by a caregiver. This can include, but is not limited to rough handling, shoving, hair pulling, ear pulling, shaking, slapping, kicking, biting, pinching, hitting, or spanking. And emotional abuse can be defined as the infliction of verbal and psychological abuse on a child by a caregiver, such as name calling or ostracism, shaming, giving them derogatory remarks about them or their family, or threats. It also says that caregivers shall give each child guidance Remember the word guidance goes along with the word discipline about teaching, about modeling, about helping them desire or, or attain new skills. So a provider shall discuss methods of behavior guidance with parents at the time of admission and the parent standards shall be considered by the provider. Behavior guidance must be constructive, positive, and suited to the age of the child. And methods of intervention guidance and redirection must be used. We'll be talking about some of these later on today. So when we talk about effective discipline, here are some of the qualities or some of the things that go along with what it means to effectively discipline. Effective discipline can help a child feel a sense of connection, belonging, and significance. It's also very mutually respectful and it is encouraging for them. It's being kind and firm at the same time. It's being able to set a boundary and say, we are not allowed to do that and do it in a very kind way. It's also very effective long-term. This considers what the child's feeling and thinking and learning and deciding about themselves in the world and can teach effective and important social skills like respect or concern for others or problem solving, cooperation and things like that. So effective discipline, as you can tell, could really have a positive impact. And I just think about kids who are being raised with this and how differently they might parent kids compared to how we might have been parented. So when we use effective ki discipline, kids are learning that um, they can have self-control. They learn it can be really effective with teenagers and older child children. It can build their self-esteem, and it sets a good example of effective ways to solve problems and teaches new ways to handle things. Whereas if we're if we're using harsh punishment, children are learning to only be good when we're looking, um, or to deceive us, 
And it typically doesn't work very well with teenagers. In fact, it gets in the way of developing relationships and connections with them. It tears down self-esteem and it teaches the child that violence or being mean is an acceptable way to solve problems. So we're thinking about changing the approach. We're thinking about concepts such as using connection before correction. Um, it's this idea that building the relationship with a child is actually more important than changing their behavior, especially at the beginning of the relationship. In fact, building the relationship is actually necessary before behavior can change. Most of us don't change our behavior with somebody else in a relationship until we feel safety with them, until we trust them, until we've committed to doing things better because of this other person and the relationship we have developed. This is about prioritizing alliance and coming together rather than just straight up compliance. And our goal isn't just about consequences, although there are natural consequences and logical consequences that go into these things. This is about a, creating a path to solutions. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of thinking again. So let's say a child misbehaves or they act in a way that you're not um, okay with and you feel it needs to be changed. I'm gonna ask you to ask yourself these questions first. Why might the child be behaving this way? Why does it bother me? If the child is engaging in, in this behavior, what are the long-term consequences? And what can I do right now? What can I do in the short run about this? So again, it's this idea of, of managing our behavior to manage theirs. That means taking a look inside and reflecting on what's going on for us so that we can use that to help inform us as we take the next steps in interacting with the child or deciding what they need to learn in order to do things differently. So this idea about reflective functioning, and you might be wondering, like, what does this mean to be reflective? I've asked you to reflect a couple of times now, and so I'm going to give you a little bit more information and definition about this. So I want you to take a look at this picture. We've got this mama duck walking along with her baby chicks and or her baby ducklings, and she's coming up to this sewer grate. And as she crosses the sewer grate, they get across and only one baby is left on the side with her. Now, I like to believe that most parents all want to do, I like to believe that parents have good intentions. They want their kids to be safe. They want things to be okay for their kids. So I don't believe that this mama duck was walking up to the sewer grate thinking, how many kids can I get rid of today? They are driving me nuts, right? While they might be feeling that she really wouldn't want any harm to come on them. So that leaves us to question then, so if she didn't intend for this to happen, what got in the way? And so if we stop to think about that, we might identify things like, I wonder if she's ever crossed a sewer grate before. Maybe she didn't know what would happen if they walked across this. Or maybe the other threat of a car coming towards them was more dangerous than the sewer grate itself. Or we might be thinking, did she take in per into perspective how big her chicks are or her ducklings are in comparison to her own feet or her own body? Has she ever taken them across something like this in the past? Right? There's so many things that we could consider about why this might happen, even though she didn't intend for it to happen. Now, if you're like me and you have um, a heart that really wants to make sure that everybody's okay, especially our babies, I actually got quite stirred up the first time I saw this picture. And so I want you to know that this came from a video called Bad Mother Duck, which I don't really agree with the title because I, like I said, I don't think any parent strives to be a bad parent. But what happened is all of the babies got saved. They were able to open up that sewer grate. They got all of the ducklings out and on their way they went. So if we were to define then what reflective functioning is, it's this idea of being able to recognize the mental states, feelings, thoughts, intention in ourselves and in others. This might be things like, I'm hoping we can just get through today without any major issues or I wonder why they seem so angry. So just starting to take note of feelings or thoughts that are happening either in ourselves or others. And then we're going to link them to behavior because how we think and feel usually shows up in our behavior. So this might be thinking like, oh, I'm irritable because I am so behind in my housework or I'm so behind at work or thinking about, oh, I wonder if they're acting that way because of that show that they just watched on TV, right? So it's this idea of kind of connecting these things together which leads, to, leads us to insights and awareness that can help us think about, hmm, if this is what's going on, what can we do to impact this? So reflective functioning is a way of being. It's a portable lens that we can use for observing interactions and emotions and our own reactions. 
It also holds in mind that all behavior has meaning. And if all behavior has meaning, we can start to think about what is this child trying to tell me through this be- through their behavior? What am I trying to tell myself or what awareness do I need for myself thinking about my own reaction to something as well? So you may have heard about this before, but we like to say sometimes that um, behavior is kind of like an iceberg. And just like there's more to an iceberg than you can see, there's a lot more to a, our behavior than what we can see as well. The iceberg is just the tip of what we can see, and that's the behavior. What all of the things are that are contributing to that behavior is what's going on underneath and maintaining that iceberg. So as you can see here, what we might see are angry or shouting or biting or refusal, swearing, hitting, rage, hoarding, those types of things. And what might be going on underneath are they're communicating distress. They're feeling anxious. Uh, There might be sensory overload. They might be tired. They might not be feeling well. They might be feeling shame. They might be triggered by past experiences. Might be feeling discomfort or are anticipating feeling rejected. Might be feeling sad or threatened. And then there's also a context such as family dynamics or what available supports they have or what pressures are going on around them that also contribute to that iceberg being maintained. So sometimes it's interesting to slow down and just think about a behavior and step into this. This can even be used for ourselves where we might go like, Oh, I am really annoyed with enter enter a person there, right? It might be a coworker, it might be your partner, it might be a friend of yours. And then we can start thinking about what's what's going on here. Like, oh, this person is reminding me of this person, or I'm realizing that there's a lot of other stress happening outside of my work right now that might be contributing to that. When we slow down to do that, we oftentimes can take perspectives that we haven't been able to in the past. And sometimes we can even address those things underneath so that the iceberg underneath can get smaller, resulting in the behaviors up on top, also reducing in size or at least in intensity. So I'm going to ask you to do this activity called a hot button activity. This is one of the handouts that came in your packet, and it can be helpful sometimes just to take that piece of paper out and to write on it. And if you don't have it printed out, maybe just do this in a a thinking way with me. So I'm going to ask you, think about a behavior that pushes your buttons, that when somebody does this thing or says this thing, you're just like, oh, no, you didn't, right? That's that hot button experience. And so I want you to just picture somebody doing that thing. Maybe it's somebody cutting you off in traffic. Maybe it's somebody whining. Maybe it's somebody, a, a kiddo spitting or getting aggressive. Maybe it's somebody being defiant. Just bring that behavior to mind. Let yourself see it and let yourself take notice of what feelings it brings up in you. Because these these behaviors do bring up feelings in us. So then name, what is that feeling you have when that behavior is happening? What are you noticing? What's that feeling? What's it making your body want to do? And now if that feeling was in charge of directing your next step or or, or your reaction to that behavior, what would your reaction be? And now if you stepped in and did that, had that reaction to the behavior with this person, what kind of impact might that have on the relationship that you are trying to develop? So some examples that other parents have shared with me in the past might be uh, a child who is being very defiant or refusing to do what they have been asked. And that when that happens, they start to feel frustrated. They start to feel irritated. They start to feel annoyed. And that if they're feeling directed their reaction, they might yell at the child or they might take away dessert or a privilege of some sort. um, Or they might, they might have a kind of like a temper tantrum in response to the child Um, or step into the power struggle with their child, and that the impact on that oftentimes is one of feeling like they want to withdraw from the child, or they want to get away from the child. And the child then might feel that and might feel like you're not here to help me with these things, or might feel um, like your anger is scary to them. And it typically does not create really warm fuzzies in a relationship. And so we're going to have to think about that as adults. What are we going to do to manage those feelings when the behavior happens? Now, I know a lot of people will tell me like, just because I'm feeling a certain way, I don't always let that handle or direct my reaction. And that's great. 
And that's fantastic. And I'm really glad to hear that we're doing that. But there's going to be some behaviors that in that moment, it's just going to feel really big and overwhelming, especially if you add in back to that iceberg metaphor, maybe you have a lot of your own stressors going on. And so your fuse is shorter too. And so having a new reaction or a new way of handling ourselves when these behaviors come up can be a way to change how things have happened in the past. Um, I sometimes like to ask people, the behavior that you identified as the one pushing your buttons, if you had done that behavior in your home growing up or with the caregivers that raised you, how would have they reacted? Might it have been one of their hot buttons behaviors as well? We find that oftentimes these um, hot button behaviors do get passed on generationally, kind of like a recipe, sometimes where it's happening in one, one generation, sometimes it's passed on and, and thought of as a frustrating behavior in another generation. So unlike how it might feel, kids actually don't want to use challenging behavior to communicate. None of us really do, right? None of us are enjoy arguing just for the sake of arguing. None of us want to hurt or upset somebody else just because something hasn't gone our way. And so if we don't want to, what's happening, right? Young children and children in general, they're just learning to navigate this world and learning how to regulate their emotions and behavior. They're going to make mistakes. We all do. And they're going to make mistakes and that has to be okay for them to make mistakes. And just thinking about that too, if you had a, had a, stepped into a mistake or made a mistake, how would you want somebody to respond to that? So this goes back to that boss example that we were talking about earlier. You know, if you make a mistake at, at work, how do you want somebody to handle that? Do you want them to call up your partner and tell them how bad you were today or how naughty you were today at work? Um, I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't want that. That wouldn't be an effective way to help me change my behavior or help me learn what I should be doing instead. So one of the other handouts that you have is something called a behavior thinking guide. I oftentimes uh, work with families who are really struggling with some of these behaviors. And I find that by slowing down and taking time to look through this guide, we oftentimes can figure out a new way of responding or at least help us, us to identify some hypotheses about what might be going on in this for this behavior to continue happening. Um, and so I, I recommend that you pull this, this handout out or bring it up on your screen and take a look at it. As you can see on here, it's, it's asking you about what are the concerns you're having? What patterns have you started to notice? What do you know about their relationships or their past experiences? How is this child doing developmentally? What's going well for this child? And this helps us develop a hypothesis statement. So for example, um, I was working with a family who um, had a child who was being quite defiant um, about getting in the car and, and getting buckled up to go to school. And this child would often stall in the morning and do whatever they could to make sure that it, they were getting out of the house late. And so the parent was like, I can't get late to work because I'm going to get in trouble at work. And so this isn't working for us. They're like, you know, so we said, okay, what are the concerns? The concerns are that this child is taking a long time to get dressed in the morning and to get out of the house and that they seem to be stalling. And the patterns that they've noticed is that it's more in the morning when they're headed out than it is later on in the day. And when we started thinking about what do we know about this child's past experiences, we knew that this child used to, um, when they were an infant, they were um, had parents who were experiencing a lot of substance abuse and their own mental health things. And so this baby sat in their car seat a lot without a lot of interaction. And we also know that this baby's needs weren't always met when, so when they cried and they were hungry, sometimes adults didn't come to help them. And we also know that sometimes they would get dropped off at random people's houses and were just left there for, for days or weeks on end. And so we were thinking about their past experience and we started thinking about, let's say this is a four-year-old child. How are they doing developmentally? Well, their speech and language isn't fantastic. They have a really difficult time with some of their emotional behavior regulation. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, gross motor, fine motor, they seem to be doing pretty good. They're toilet trained, like they're they're on track in some ways, but also kind of have some challenges in other ways. And then we thought about what's going well for this child. And well, this child has gotten toilet trained and the child is sleeping much better than they used to. They're eating a, a better amount of food than they used to. And so then we start to think like, okay, so we have a four-year-old child who's engaged in, in, this, in this dawdling behavior or this avoiding behavior in the morning when they need to get out of the house. And then we go, okay, because, hmm, because sometimes separation has been scary for them. 
because sometimes being in a car seat has been really uncomfortable and has left them feeling that like they might be stuck in a car seat for a long time or being buckled might feel really scary or traumatic, like a trauma trigger for them. Hmm, that's an interesting thing to think about, right? So if that's what's going on for them and we're now thinking that something about their past experience might make this behavior make sense, we can then say, so what do they need, right? What do they need? So they might need to know that I'm going to bring you to childcare and then I'm going to work and then I'm going to come back and pick you up just like I have every other day. I'm not going to leave you there just because you might have gotten left places in the past, but I'm not going to leave you there. I'm going to come back at the end of the day. And you might want to talk with the child care provider about helping them remind their child that they're coming back for them at the end of the day. Maybe you even leave a special thing at child care for the child to help remember them. Maybe it's a picture of you. Maybe it's a picture of the two of you together to help them know that you are thinking about them and that you won't forget them. We also might think about if this is more sensory related about being buckled into that car seat, we might have to think about what could we do differently because kids have to be buckled when they go in the car, but we might be able to help them know, yep, when you were little, you used to sit in a car seat for a long time and sometimes your body remembers how that feels. And when you get in your car seat in the car, it might remind you of that. But now we know that you only stay in your car seat for a certain amount of time until we get there. In fact, we can set a timer so you can see how long it takes us to get there, or we can turn on the GPS, and then you'll know that you're only going to be in the car seat for that long, right? So this idea of slowing it down and thinking about what might be going on in order to think about what we can do differently to support this child and having a different outcome can often lead us to feeling much more successful, but also helping to take into consideration what this child's traumas have been or their scary things have been. And I know as foster parents, there's going to be a lot of times that you're not going to know what's going on for these kiddos. You might not know what their past experience has been. And so sometimes we're going to have to do some, some detective work or some guessing, and that's okay. We don't have to know exactly what has happened to them in order to be able to help them. All right, so a quick review, like I mentioned on stress and trauma, Gonna encourage you to go ahead and take a stretch break. So I'm gonna just give us a moment to pause. All right, hopefully you got up and stretched. Maybe you even went and used the restroom or checked your phone quick. Um, as we know, it's sometimes important just to move our bodies a little bit. So very quick reminder on when I'm talking about stress and trauma, what does this mean? So when we talk about trauma, we're talking about events that are perceived as threatening the life and, and or physical integrity of the child or someone important to the child. So we now know that trauma doesn't have to happen exactly or directly to the child. We also know that it happening to their caregiver is almost as if it has happened to them. And what we perceive as threatening can change as we grow and as we, as we have different experiences. And when this situation or this event happens, it causes an overwhelming sense of terror or helplessness or horror. And it produces, produces some intense physical effects such as a pounding heart or rapid breathing or trembling or shaking. And we know that it completely overwhelms the child's available coping strategies. We also, like I mentioned before, we're talking about stress and trauma. So our stress response system is, is designed to keep us protected from these types of situations. So it helps us remember exactly what happened so that if we ever perceive it happening again, we can change or we can get ourselves in a safe place. So a couple of the components are why we're thinking about this stress and trauma lens. We know that stress and trauma, especially prolonged stress, can impact our neurobiology and our development, especially our regulation systems. And in children, trauma affects the way that the brain develops. We also know that the impact it happens to relationships and, and what we might expect from others in the world around us. It's actually shaping our beliefs and expectations. And as I just mentioned, we don't actually have to know what that is, what that stress or trauma has been. We just need to know what it looks like in order for us to be helpful. I'm bringing this back into our perspective and helping us think about this because trauma and stress have significantly impacted the child that you are going to be working with or the children that you'll be working with and that you'll be raising. And they need us to keep this in mind because their experiences have been different than other typically developing children. And so we have to keep that in mind and make adaptations for them. So here is a video um, called TBRI, Trust-Based Trust Relationship Interventions. 
And I want you to think about how the stress and trauma piece that we've been talking about and some of what they're thinking and, and um, saying we can do in this video to help children might be connected to discipline or ways of parenting. TBRI, trust-based relational intervention, has at its core building a trusting relationship. It has three sets of principles and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries and I say, yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places. And for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, eye contact, and I give words, I am gonna empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, well, those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. If this child didn't have this experience, that child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered, first by knowing they're safe, second by nutrient-rich foods, third by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion, and fourth by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior, correcting, means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame, so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. I'm curious to be asked about that video and what stuck out to you or what was your overall reaction to what you heard. Take a moment just to really think about what you heard. Oftentimes when I have done this training with parents in the past, they've told me that it can make them feel hopeful. Um, that the little, the little things that they can do on a daily basis of taking care of a child and meeting their needs can help to rewire that system. It can help to settle that brain chemistry and that it is sometimes in all of those little tiny interactions. It's, it's helping them regulate when they need it. It's helping bring warmth when they're cold. It's helping check in with them when they're coming home from school and they're slamming their backpack around and looking very frustrated. Um, those, there's all sorts of little ways that we can step in and help a child experience maybe what they didn't previously and give that to them as a gift. And for some of us, it also might be that we didn't receive some of those things as a child. And so it can also be healing for us to provide that for somebody else in that way. All right, we're going to make this transition now into thinking a little bit more about discipline strategies and tools and ways that we can approach this work that we are doing. So as we talk about behavior strategies, we're going to be talking about proactive things, things that we can do to prevent behavior. The best behavior strategies we can have is the one that prevents it from happening in the first place, right? And then also because we can't always prevent it, we're also going to look at those responsive strategies. 
things that we might have to do in the moment when they happen. So some of those proactive things can include teaching and practicing relationship building, teaching regulation strategies, and thinking about what's coming next and preparing the child for that transition. And we'll talk more about the responsive strategies in just a little bit. So some of these proactive strategies, we're gonna go deeper into these different areas. So they mentioned in the video as well, this idea of a felt sense of safety. And so we're gonna explore that as well as what it looks like to build connections with children to help them develop emotional regulation and create a sense of predictability in the environments that, we're, that we have. So as it says in this quote, the opposite of fear is felt safety. And we know how to promote self safe, felt safety is through connection. That's by Dr. David Cross. So the opposite of fear is felt safety. Felt safety is not the same as just being physically safe. It's knowing that I am safe in this place and in this space and with these people. So we often think um, as foster and adoptive parents that since our home is safe and our and that we are loving these kids and that we are there for them, that they should feel safe. But we fail to recognize that there is a difference between, our, between kids being safe and feeling safe. Being safe doesn't always necessarily mean that they feel safe. So felt safety happens when a child feels or perceives that they are safe in their environment. So I want you to think about somebody who feels like a safe person for you or a safe relationship. And I want you to think about how do you know that you're safe with them? What is it about that relationship or about that person that helps you to know that you are safe with them, that they believe in you, that they trust in you, that they are going to be there for you? Those are the things that we're going to help think about with kids in this idea of felt safety. And here is a video about felt safety that also comes from the TBRI model. Certain concepts in TBRI is this concept of felt safety. And the reason we have it is because oftentimes when children from hard places come into care, they are wired for survival mode, meaning that they have experienced trauma and all of their behaviors are geared around making sure that they can survive. And so when they come into a new home that's safe, they don't actually know what it feels like to be safe. And so it's really important for caregivers to understand the difference because caregivers know their home is safe but the child doesn't know that because they've never experienced safety before. So one of the things that we instruct caregivers to do is to help them feel safe. And we do that by making sure that the caregiver set the bar in the most appropriate place. In order for a child to feel safe, they need to be seen and heard and valued. And in order for them to be seen, heard and valued, they have to be able to have success, which means that as the caregiver, we're gonna say yes a lot, and we're gonna keep the bar low so that they can achieve success, and then we're gonna praise them for that success. So it's really important that we set the bar low in order for a child to feel safe in their home. So the idea of felt safety, right? And, and thinking about making adjustments to our expectations and our environment while kids are learning to feel safe in our environment. So another thing that I mentioned was this idea around emotional regulation. Um, and we oftentimes really struggle with this, even as adults, we're not fully developed in our capacity to manage and emo our emotions. So we need to teach about feelings. We need to talk about feelings. We need to express feelings in safe ways for kids so that they can see how we might be doing it. And this comes by naming those emotions. You actually can't tame what you can't name. It's really hard to calm yourself down if you don't know what this thing is that you are feeling. So we're going to do this by naming emotions. We might read books about emotions. We might watch videos. Um, you might be watching a show with a child and you might point out, wow, that character got really angry. What do you think was making them angry? Or how can we tell that they looked angry? And we're going to help point out what those features are that they're seeing on that person's face or on their own face or where they're feeling it in their body. Oftentimes these things have not been connected. I work with a lot of parents and many parents are struggling with this concept around emotions and knowing how they feel themselves. And so it's important for us to do this. We also are going to be there with kids through the emotion. We can't abandon them while they're drowning in that emotion. And I know that that sometimes seems like, well, what does that mean? If they're really being angry and aggressive, am I just supposed to stay there and take it? And that's not what I'm referring to. You might need to give yourself a little space to be safe 
but you can also say, I'm here for you. I know you are really angry right now. I'm here for you. It's going to be okay. Right? And you're going to wait it out with them in as, as safe a way as you can and in as calm of a way as you can. You might have to think about that hot button reaction. You might be all stirred up inside and you're going to have to try to calm your own emotional response in those moments as well. There's a lot of things too that we can do to express emotions. We might dance with music to different feelings or 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 listen like is this a happy song is this a sad song is this a mad song what does that look like when we're feeling those things you might draw it how does it feel when you're when you're when you're feeling that way show me on paper or what color does this make you think about there are tons of resources out there i also recommend just having like a poster of different feelings faces or expressions in the environment so that we can use them to help name and build up the vocabulary identification for your feelings as well. We can also reflect those feelings. So we might need to name for the child what we're seeing, but we don't want to say that you are, we don't want to say you are mad. We want to say you are feeling mad, or it looks like, um, it looks like mad is going on inside of you right now. In many other languages, the language around feelings actually has to do with a feeling being on you, not necessarily a feeling being who you are as an identity. And so we might need to be really aware of and identify those feelings for them. So we might need to say like, oh, I see your face is going like this. I see your hands are going like this. I wonder if you are feeling angry, right? We also have to give permission to have feelings. I don't know about you, but if somebody told me, you know, that I shouldn't feel a certain way, that usually doesn't help me feel any better or make me feel like, oh, you're right, I shouldn't be angry. Sometimes it makes me even more angry. So we have permission to feel the feelings that we're having. We might not have permission to act out in ways that are hurting others or, or something like that though, right? I mentioned expanding that feelings vocabulary. Um, you know, if you think of the word mad, like there's the word mad, but there's also feeling like irritated. And then there's feeling enraged. Like those are very different emotional intensities. And so think about not just the, the basic words that we might use for describing emotions, but the wide range of vocabulary that we have to um, also describe the, the intensity of what we might be feeling. So we want to accept those feelings, even the ones that are hard to listen to. Um, you might have grown up in a family where certain feelings were, were expected to be shut down or, or avoided rather than felt. And that doesn't actually mean that you didn't feel those things. It just meant that you weren't allowed to show them. And so they were kind of shoved and stuffed inside. So we want to also allow them to be able to name those feelings, even if they feel uncomfortable for us. In fact, as adults, the more we practice this, the better we get with our feelings as well. And accept correction, right? Sometimes they're going to get it wrong and you might need to say, let's try that again. Give them a chance. And there might be times that we miss the mark. We might say that they're feeling a certain way and that is not at all how they're feeling. Or we, we might make assumptions that are incorrect. And so we have to be open to hearing from them what we said, what we said and, and how that fit for them and maybe what we need to do differently next time. It's also really important to address the fact that or name the fact that your cultural background, and this can be your family culture that you grew up in. This can also be um, a community culture. Uh, this can be religious backgrounds. This can be all sorts of different versions of culture, but how we learn to manage feelings is also a cultural expression. And so being respectful of and aware of or asking questions about what did this look like in your family? How was this appropriate or what was not appropriate in your family? Um, as well as thinking about that for yourself as, as well. All right, so in this video, what we're going to see is two adults, and one of them is going to be taking the role of being a parent, and the other one is going to be taking the role of a child. And they're going to play out different ways that people may have handled emotions um, or, or do handle emotions. And I want you just to watch for what looks familiar. I'm guessing that you might pick up on something that maybe your own caregivers may have done for you or that maybe you have a tendency to do. And um, at the end, they're going to do it a different way. And the way that they do it at the end, as they're doing it, I want you to notice how it feels inside of you to watch what they're doing. And um, we'll be talking about it more in just a little bit. Hi. Hi. 
Ooh. And the, the yeah. hamster died. Yeah. And Charlie died. <laughs> we'll get another one. We'll get you another one. We'll get you another one. I, you know what? I know exactly who's got more, okay? But let's, no, we have to get another one. We have to do this. We have to get another one. I'm gonna fix this for you. We'll get another one, okay? I, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah. He's, it's a little bot. Yeah, that's what they do, and they get yeah, stiff. Yeah. yeah, you probably noticed that. Yeah, we'll take care of it. I'll have, you know what? I'll have your dad take care of it. I don't wanna touch him. I don't wanna touch him. It's not, it's not a big deal, sweetheart. It's not a big deal. Hamsters, they come and go. They're like a dime a dozen. Didn't we just talk about this? You have. I, you take no responsibility for things. Look at this. Look at who puts your clothes away every day. You take no responsibility for anything. No wonder he died. The, Charlie, that yeah. rodent you have in your room. No, Charlie. Yeah. He died. Yeah. Oh. I, I just oh, found him. He's yeah. in the room. He's laying there. He yeah. just looks like he was. You know, okay. Um, but, can you take these back to your room when you go, and then you can take care of that. Just wrap them in here. Just wrap them in there. That would be great. Okay. That's really hard. You oh, love Charlie so I love much. Charlie. You were so good with Charlie too. He you would were. go around this little thing and yeah, yell. Yeah, 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 I may never do it again. Oh, never do it again. When you're ready, we'll decide what's best for parting with Charlie. And we're gonna get through this together. We are, you're not alone. You're not alone. You'll be there for me. Yes. In fact, we're going to be there right now together. Let's go right now, and we'll take care of little Charlie. Okay, Mom. Let's go. So as that, as I mentioned in that video, I wanted you to take notice of what you, um, what may have happened for you growing up or how you might use some of those initial strategies. And then also what it felt like when she did it differently. So when the mom figure took that like, oh, right. And pulled her in and gave her that hug and kind of organized for her what was going on and said, I'm going to be here with you. I know many of us as adults or people watching this video, even we go, like we could feel the regulation happen in that moment. And compared to the other ones where it was kind of like emotions were being pushed away or ignored or, or dismissed. Um, so this idea of doing it differently, of coming alongside of them, right? We're going to spend that energy with them anyways in those emotions. And if we can do it in a way that feels good for them and for us, they actually get more efficient at, at handling it. And we feel really good helping them. Like if you help somebody calm down who's been really upset, it just feels good. So conscious discipline, which is um, who this video and that training comes from, or that um, approach comes from some has something called the DNA process. So DNA stands for describe, name, and acknowledge. So describe means that you're like seeing, oh, I see you're really upset. Your eyes are going like this. Your mouth is going like this. Your hands are going like this. And you might actually mirror back to them what you're seeing. And then you take a deep breath. You make eye contact with them. You seem sad, right? You were wanting to go outside and play today, and now it is raining, and you are sad about that. Or you were hoping that you would get a turn playing that, and now it is bedtime, and you are feeling, right? So this idea of DNA is a really easy way to slow us down and say, okay, describe what's going on here, take that deep breath, name the emotion, and acknowledge what might be going on. And it's a really effective way of modeling this for kids, and um, it's also pretty short and sweet, so it's easy to remember. Another one of the handouts that you have in your packet are a three-page handout of regulation activities. I often use these with families to help practice and teach regulation um, strategies. 
So it's really hard for kids to actually take deep breaths unless they've really been taught how to do it. So encouraging them to like lay on the floor and put something on their stomach and then so they can watch it rise and fall can be a really helpful way to learn how to take that deep breath. That's actually really that resetting breath. Um, so these are a little bit more for younger kids. Um, there's also great ones that you can use with older kids as well. I recommend even just Googling some regulation activities um, or mindfulness activities and um, practice them. It's also really important to practice these when kids are calm. We have a tendency to want to try these things when they're in the midst of the emotion. If we haven't tried it when they're calm, they're not going to be able to do it with us when they're in, we're in, when they're deep in that emotion. So I recommend for parents, like try three to five of these every day. Um, and you might use it like, okay, as we're headed to the bath, let's practice one of these, or as we're getting ready for bed, let's practice one of these, or in the morning after they wake up, maybe doing that big starfish stretch and encourage Encouraging them just to stretch their whole body and take those deep breaths, right? It's really helpful for us to practice them with them because it's also at least three to five times during the day that we get a chance to regulate and practice these things as well. Um, and just a, a word of wisdom, um, we know that sometimes deep breathing, it requires us to take a minimum of three deep breaths to really reset our nervous system. So recommend if you're doing one deep breath, don't just stop with one, do two or three of them um, as a way of really kind of resetting that system. Um, so hopefully you find that handout useful. Um, I, there's pictures on there. Sometimes parents will actually print out those pictures and post them up so that they have those pictures around and kids can point to them and practice them as well. Um, so hopefully you find that as a helpful resource. All right, so we're moving into the connection portion then of our proactive strategies. So children aren't going to say, I had a hard day, can we talk? Instead, what they're going to say is, will you play with me? They're going to ask you to step into relationship with them. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like to play with kids. So as a therapist, I use a lot of play strategies. And sometimes I actually teach parents a little bit about some of the tools that we use while we're playing. And the type of play that I'm talking about is what we're calling child-led playing. So this is where the child is kind of in the lead and we're, we're a partner in their play. We're following their directions in the play. And of course, we want to do this within parameters of safety and, and um, you know, not hurting people or other things, but they might need to show us some scary things that have happened, or they might need to use dolls or toys to make sense of what is happening. Um, and so when we follow a child's lead in their play, we're also saying to them that you deserve to be seen, heard, and understood. Think about sitting in a conversation with a, a dear friend and saying what you need to say, even if it's maybe not the easiest thing to say and, and expressing with them about how hard a day was or how sad the information was that you just got about a friend and a cancer diagnosis or something like that. And it just feels like they are fully present with you and, and paying attention and listening to you. When those things happen, we feel seen, heard, and understood as well. This is something that we all enjoy feeling. So this is how we can use play to help with that. So one of the things that we can do is tracking. So this is pretty much stating what they're doing factually without labeling. So I also call call this being like a sports caster. Um, like, oh, I see you're putting the red block on top of the blue block. Oh, I see you put that doll on the bed. Oh, I see you took that baby and now you're rocking it and feeding it, right? You don't want to do this with every single thing that they're doing because they might look at you and they might wonder what in the world you're doing. So, but just kind of noticing what they're doing. And when you do that, what you're communicating to, their, to them is that I notice you, I see you, I am interested in what you are doing. I'm paying attention and you've got my full attention right now. I'm not on my phone. I'm not distracted by other things. I am here with you. The next thing that we talk about is restating, which is kind of repeating what the child is saying to you without adding meaning. So they might say like, and then they got hit and you say, oh, then they got hit. So you're not adding to it or, or making a, an assumption about it. You're just repeating it like, yeah, and they were really angry. They were really angry. And sometimes I even recommend using the tone of voice or the pace that they have. And when we do this, what we're communicating to them is I hear what you are saying and I am curious about what you are saying. And then the other tool that we use sometimes is the idea of reflecting. So this kind of takes that restating, but adds into maybe what the emotion might be that's happening in that. So, oh, they got really angry. I see that makes you worried. Or I see that makes that doll worried, right? Sometimes we stay in the metaphor of the play. Um, or we might, 
we might add in like, oh, I wonder if somebody felt really scared when that happened. So you're adding an emotion component to it. And what this communicates to the child is I notice how you feel, or I notice the feelings that are coming up in the play. So these are three very simple things to do while you're playing with a child. In when I'm working with families, I typically recommend if you can have five to 10 minutes a day of this kind of child-led play where you are stepping into their world and you are you are just present with them, they oftentimes will let you know a lot about what has happened and what their experiences have been. And so I hope that you um I hope that you try these things. This works with older kids too. Um, we don't do as much of the restating piece because they sometimes um, don't like to be have us repeat exactly what they're saying. Um, but we might be, wow, I hear I heard what you said. Um, or we might say, wow, that sounds like it was really hard to hear, or they really did say all of that. Um, so you might it still might happen more in conversation rather than in play, but it also might happen while you're doing something like throwing a football around or while you're cooking together or doing some of those types of activities. All right, so then the third or the fourth area about our proactive strategies had to do with predictability, consistency, stability, those types of things. And one of the ways that we do that is by having consistent rules and expectations. And um, so I want you to just take a moment, maybe even just grab a piece of paper and think about what were families or what were the rules in your family when you were growing up? And how did you learn those rules? And what happened if you broke a rule? So just take a little time. Maybe even pause the video so you have a little bit of time and, and write those things down. Oftentimes when I ask parents about this, they will they will tell me that either the rules, they, they learned the rules in their family when they broke a rule, like they didn't know it was a rule until they broke it and got in trouble, or that their family had very strict rules about who could do what, who sat where, who had permission to do things. Um, other people have said that um, they, they didn't really have any rules or expectations growing up, um, but then everyone so they would get in big trouble and they weren't quite sure why, right? So so thinking about how we learn the rules. You could also apply this to that workplace model like we were talking before. Like, how do you learn the rules that you have at work that you have to follow? Are there policies and procedures? Are there uh, things written down next to a task that tells you what you need to do? Um, you know, what are the rules for driving, right? There, there's rules all over the place that we have to follow in many of the tasks that we do. And so rules are a really effective way of helping us all know how something works in this place and with these people. Um, they also prepare kids for the real world, right? There's going to be rules at school. There's going to be rules driving. There's going to be rules when they play sports and things like that. It also teaches kids how to socialize and interact with each other. It also can provide a sense of order. Imagine trying to drive where there's no rules of the road to let us know who's supposed to go first at a stop sign or, or that there's stoplights and we have to um, follow the expectations or the speed limit, right? It provides a sense of order for us on the road. It also can help us feel competent. Like if we know what the rules are and I know what's expected of me here, I just feel like, oh, I know how to function and be successful in this environment. They um, help reassure kids. They help kids feel safe. And when they see that we can maintain those rules and keep them consistent, they also learn to trust us. It helps them to, to know that they can trust that we will keep them safe and it boosts their confidence as well. A sense of I got this can be boosted when they know how things work in this experience or in this place. So thinking about the rules for your house, like you get to set what those rules are. And you might even think about how you want to introduce those rules to kids that are coming into your home. I think it's important to remember, though, that your foster child has come from a different environment in a different home. And there may have been a different set of rules there. And they might not know that the rules here might be different or similar to what they've experienced in other settings. It's also really unrealistic for us to expect them to just behave a certain way, especially right off the bat, like giving them a rule and then them just expecting them to follow it immediately might not be realistic. It wouldn't be realistic for us as adults either. So some habits will change quickly, but others are going to take a long time or, or might not change at all. So we have to give them some leeway. We have to give them some grace. We have to give them time to practice and learn. And it's it's okay to reiterate or, or restate the rules when necessary, but really try to be overly strict as they adjust to these new surroundings. 
sometimes when I'm talking to parents about rules, I'll say, okay, think about going on a first date with somebody. And you get to the restaurant and you you sit down across the table from them and they say, all right, I need to let you know that I have some rules about relationships. Um, you will not meet my extended family until we've been dating for six months. There is no texting or calling while I am at work. Uh, I shut my phone off at 9 p.m. every night and I expect not to be bothered after that. Um, you will buy all of your own things. I won't buy anything for you. Like if you went to a date and they started talking to you that way, would you want a second date with that person? Right. So as a kid comes into your home, you might not want to just stop and just talk about all of the rules all at once. You might want to think of it more as like an orientation, maybe helping them like, OK, here's where this stuff goes. We take our shoes off when we come in the door so that we don't get mud on the carpet. And this is your room. And here's where you can put all of your things that you have. And um, we just ask that, you know, any wet towels get hung up in the bathroom or when you're hungry, here's where the food is, or here's how to get a snack, or here's where to put your dishes after you use them, right? There's lots of things to learn. And so think of it a little bit more like an orientation. Like what do they need to know first? And then adding to it as you go. I've worked with some foster parents who have, um, they put up like pictures on the wall or some of those vinyl let letters on the wall that have to do with like respect or care and concern or um, some of those words. And then they have them up on the wall. And then sometimes during dinner or sometimes during a, a family activity, they might pick one of those out and ask, like, what does that word mean to you? What does that look like when we are interacting in our family? What does that look like to respect our home and the toys and the, and the things that we have here? And so they use them more as um, teaching values instead of just hardcore rules. So really think about your rules that you want to have in your home. And if you already have maybe biological children, maybe it's helpful to think about what those rules are that you've already set, but actually make them concrete. Um, so that you really know what they are. Sometimes rules are unspoken rules more than they are spoken rules. Um, and then think about how you might want to introduce them to a child who's moving into your home. Another thing that we're going to think about in regards to um, this idea of connection, but also in regards to helping shape expectations, is the idea of praise versus encouragement. So um, maybe you were like me, um, as I was learning to be a teacher and as I was learning to be a parent, um, I was often told to praise your children, tell them what they're doing well, tell them what makes you happy. And we thought that that was being a good parent at that time. What we have come to find out is that our kids who relieved, received a lot of praise, it was really about getting external approval from others and not as much about developing the who they are inside or the values that we thought were important. Um, and we see that there's a lot of kids now in high school and the young adults that were raised in that um, era of praise. And they oftentimes um, might be doing things to, to please other people or to be accepted by others or to get approval from other people rather than doing what's right or what they believe in. And so we're thinking about changing this and shifting this um, into a, a type of encouraging instead. So encouraging, encouragement is much more of an internal um, assessment of things. It's more about um, being our, doing our personal best despite how others might judge what good means. It also helps children learn to believe in themselves. So some examples of this, right? So a praise statement might be like, oh, I like your picture. And a statement of encouragement instead would be, tell me about your picture. A praise statement might be, I am so proud of you. And a statement of encouragement might be, you must be so proud of yourself or tell me how you made that happen. A praise statement might be, you are a good helper or a great helper, or I really like it when you help me. And a statement of encouragement could be, it, you are being helpful when you help pick up all those blocks or the way you picked up all those blocks help, helped us get to play in a game more quickly, right? Another praise statement, you are so smart or you are so beautiful. Instead, being able to say, wow, I see you are working really hard. You finally got it. That must feel so good. You stuck with it, right? Or I like how hard you are working. Oh, this is hard for you, but you are sticking with it. You're going to figure this out. Can you hear the shift? The shift has more to do about naming the value or, or what is internal within them that's helping them get through this thing or accomplish that thing. So other examples of encouragement, you know, something like, you seem to like that, or you are being kind or respectful or helpful when, um, or you, you are learning to tie that shoelace. Look, last week you had trouble, but this week you did it without a problem. 
Um, so really just thinking about shifting these, these pieces to encouragement. Um, I sometimes will tell parents, you know, maybe write a couple of these down, stick them up on a post-it note and where you spend time with your child as a way to kind of help um, cue you or help you remember what some of these statements are so that you can start to, to build them into the language you're using with your children. All right, so now we're moving into these idea, the idea of responsive strategies. So responsive strategies are going to be things that like a behavior happens and you need to respond to it. Notice that I'm calling them responsive strategies, not reactive strategies. A reactive strategy might be like more like a knee jerk reaction or back to that hot button activity, kind of that in the moment where your own irritation comes through or your own frustration or anger um, and you're reacting to a situation. Responsive means that you have reflected, that you are able to take perspectives and that you are calm in your response. It's um, it requires you to maintain your calm presence. These are things that are going to happen in the moment and you might need to override that automatic reaction. This is also maybe a time to think about doing it differently than it was done for you when you were growing up. And those things don't come naturally to us. They feel uncomfortable. The things that feel comfortable to us are things that we've experienced many times. And so sometimes doing it differently might not go well. Sometimes it might feel really uncomfortable. And so adjust and try it again. I'm also just going to encourage us to think about these attachment behaviors. So um, kids who have experienced a significant amount of trauma um, might be trying to get something different from us from a behavior that we might be aware of. And so keeping in mind that uh, attachment behaviors are about the child trying to seek a connection with us. So we have to remember that behavior is a form of communication. And if it's a form of communication, our job is not necessarily to discipline it or punishment, it's to listen. It's to help figure it out. So we might need to interpret the message. So we might think about how we interpret these behaviors, um, about thinking them through an attachment lens. Is this trying, child trying to get close to me? What is their underlying need right now? Are they trying to get comfort or support or help? Maybe it's kind of in a way that feels confusing or doesn't feel very good to us, but it's how they, it has worked for them in the past. Um, how could I respond or confirm to the child that I am responsive, right? If you have had a child or a provider who, or a parent, sorry, if they've had a parent who um, had significant depression or were, were high a lot of times while using substances or something like that, they might not be used to adults that actually pay attention to them and, and are aware of their needs. And so we might have to respond to them more frequently. We might need to take notice of them more often to let them know this adult can see your need and can help meet your need. We might need to teach them that we can do that for them. And we need to see ourselves as a learning partner rather than a power figure. So our job is not to make them behave correctly in every situation. Our job is to help them learn new ways of doing things. So some therapeutic parenting skills, right? Calm tone and facial expressions. I highly recommend that you, um, if you have a partner who sees you when you are upset, that you might ask them for feedback. You know, if I am, if I, do I actually look calm when I'm saying these things? Is my face saying something different than my words are? Is there congruence between them? Um, if, if you say something in a way that doesn't get responded to in the way that you expected, you might need to think about what were the nonverbals that you were using and what did they communicate that might not have matched your words? Um, think about the word sarcasm too. So sarcasm actually means to pick the skin off of somebody. It's meant to be hurtful. Um, and sarcasm can be very confusing for kids who have experienced um, significant trauma, um, especially neglect or verbal abuse in the past. Um, so you might need to think about not using sarcasm. And if you have teens and they use sarcasm, then make sure that they understand what that sarcasm is before you use it with them. But be careful to only use it when you're doing playful things with them rather than when you're trying to address behavior. So we don't want to use sarcasm. Again, like we talked about earlier, no physical punishment. And we really don't want to use other negative types of measures. Um, we want to have an open and understanding attitude. We want to be curious. We are going to be thinking about those clear rules and expectations that we've already set and thinking about having kind of that firm structure and boundaries. And we're going to follow through every time. If you tell a child, I will come help you as soon as I am done with this phone call, you need to go help them as soon as you are done with that phone call. If you tell them, give me five more minutes, go in five more minutes. If you say, I need you to clean up your spot at the table, encourage them to follow through on doing it. You might say, looks like you're having a hard time with that. How about if I carry the fork 
and you carry the plate, right? You might need to come alongside of them while they're learning what it means to follow through with these expectations sometimes. So TBRI also talked about this idea of an ideal response. Um, ideal stands for immediate, direct, efficient, action-based, and leveled at the behavior. And the video that I have does a better job of describing it than I can. So we're going to watch a video that talks about what this ideal response is. When a child from a hard place doesn't feel safe, the result is often behaviors that appear willful, baffling, and infuriating to caregivers. How we respond in these moments is critical, and TBRI has developed a guideline to help. The ideal response looks at the levels of behavior with the goal of moving the child to a calmer state. Immediate means dealing with misbehavior within three seconds. Meltdowns are a runaway train. A gentle word and often just the question, I see you're upset, what do you need? Hunger, dehydration, and a need for sleep are often triggers. Direct isn't glancing up from your phone and yelling across the room. It's responding with direct eye contact, proximity, and reassuring touch when possible. Efficient stresses levels of a response using a kind voice and the fewest words. Caregivers should ask, what is this behavior saying? What does this child need? And how can I teach them to get these needs met? Action-based can offer a child a do-over. Instead of punishment, a calming, smiling voice saying, let's try that again, followed by praise can create an instructional path and a positive body memory. Leveled at behavior addresses the behavior, not the child, allowing the caregiver to be an advocate, not an adversary. When you're reactive instead of proactive, you put your energy in the wrong place and miss the opportunity for a teaching moment. Playful engagement works best when the behavior is at a low level. A redo can diffuse the situation quickly. A cheerful, can you try that again with respect, can turn the tide when followed by praise. Structured engagement is needed when the situation has escalated and playful engagement has failed. If a meltdown ensues by offering the child a choice, they learn they have a voice. Can I have a compromise? Said in a firm, calm voice, followed by, good compromise, can introduce recognizable scripts a child can understand. When aggressive behavior looms, nothing is gained by responding in anger or isolation. Calming engagement says, here, come sit beside me. You seem to be having a hard time. You let me know when you're ready to talk. Remaining calm and keeping the child close changes the dynamic. When there's a potential for violence, protective engagement means first removing the child or others from the situation and letting them know that they're safe and not defined by their behavior. Helping the child to breathe and asking what they need can help restore calm. The foundation of TBRI is that behaviors are driven by fear and unmet needs, and when we avoid angry, punitive behavior ourselves, we open the door to better outcomes for our children. All right, so hopefully that helps you think about in the moment when things happen, what you might be able to do. We have another video coming up that might also just kind of show what this looks like in action. Um, but before we do that, I want to do a little activity. So just get comfortable in your chair, maybe close your eyes. And I want you to notice what happens in your body as I say these words. No, absolutely not. Mm, no, not this time. Nope. No. No. Mm -mm. No, I don't think so. Nope. No, stop. No, 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 uh-uh, no. No, uh-uh, no. Yes. Sure. Go ahead. Yes. Great idea. Yes. Let's try that. Okay. Good idea. Yes. I like that. Okay. All right. What did you notice happening in your body? Many times I hear from people that the no kind of brought up this like stressed experience or they felt unheard or they started to get irritated with me or upset with me and they didn't understand what was going on. And maybe wanted to withdraw or shut down. I even had one dad tell me one time, like if you had said no one more time, I, I kind of felt like hitting you, right? 
just like we see from kids sometimes. So the reason I do this activity, especially as you hear, heard the shift to the yes, oftentimes that brings this calmed response like, oh, okay. When our brain hears no, it literally wakes up our stress response system. It really tells us that there's scarcity or something's not going to work out for us. Our needs aren't going to get met and our body is in that stressed state. Whereas when we hear yes, or we hear sure, or okay, we have a tendency to hear it and our stress response system doesn't wake up. No, I'm not saying that we should say never say no to kids, but what I'm saying is we need to listen to how often they're hearing it from us. As adults, our job is to make sure that they eat well and that they're sleeping and that they're getting their homework done and that they're being gentle with the cat and all those types of things. And so we have to give them a lot of direction and sometimes we have to give them a lot of commands. So it's important to know how often you're saying no to a child and understand that that response, every time they hear it, adds a little bit of stress to their system. So something else that we can think about is how to say no without saying no. So these are some examples that we've come up with and how you might be able to say no without saying no in that moment. So something like, sure, as soon as you do this, then we can do that. Or first this, then that. Or, oh, how about this or this and offering two choices or an alternative. Um, we might get playful with them or, or make a funny face or engage in a challenge. Um, we might say something like, oh, I know I want M&Ms or candy before supper too. I just wish there wasn't a rule. So instead of us saying no, the rule is saying no. Or thinking about, oh, I wonder how so-and-so would handle that or what they would do in this situation. Or let's look, let's think about that together, right? Um, so just thinking about how you can say no without saying no can sometimes reduce the amount of stress that a child is feeling. It also reduces the amount of stress of how many times you have to say no. Um, so again, this might be something to put on some post-it notes in your space. So that helps remember um, what it's like to hear the word no so frequently and maybe what some ways are to say no without saying no. All right. If you haven't gotten up to move around in recently, I would recommend that you just take a pause and um, move around, stretch, take a drink of whatever you need to so that you can um, refocus back into this training. And this video coming up um, is about what this might look like in action, kind of using some of these discipline strategies or these react, these responsive strategies in the moment with a child who might've been impacted by trauma. Um, so in this video, you're going to see a teenager acting as if they are a preschooler. And you'll get to see me uh, when I was a little younger doing some acting in this as well. We had a lot of parents and caregivers telling us like, I get this trauma stuff and I understand that it impacts kids, but what does it look like to put it in action? So a colleague of my of mine and I decided to make some videos that actually, actually showed what this might look like in action. Um, there's a handout that goes with this video. It's called the Acting Out Handout um, that might be helpful to have around, um, but we're gonna go ahead and watch this video. Have you ever had a child lash out at you when you've asked them to do something that to you at least seemed like a completely reasonable request? If you've ever had this experience, you know it can be more than just a little bit frustrating, and sometimes you don't quite know what to do next in order to defuse the situation. When approaching children's challenging behaviors like lashing out at others, it's important to understand that these responses may be the result of an automatic biological stress response to sensing a threat. And children who experience high levels of stress or trauma in their young lives are more likely to respond in these ways. Essentially, children's red alert alarm starts blaring and their basic fight, flee, or freeze responses kick in and take over. And in some cases, children will act out in response to feeling threatened, not unlike the Klingons of Star Trek lore, who were way more likely to fight to the death than approach something in a calm, cool, and collected manner. And we as adults need to understand that though these behaviors make children really difficult to work with and relate to, that their responses are coming from a place of stress and not malice. And by connecting with children through relationship-based approaches that are sensitive to their experiences, we can help children feel safe and begin to develop better coping skills for when things get hard. By doing this, we're offering our help and giving children the tools they need to build their resilience or their capacity to respond to and bounce back from difficult situations. So how does this work in action? My colleague Tracy Schreifels and I are going to walk you through a role play example of a child who acts out in response to transition in the early care environment. And we're going to show you some relationship based therapeutic techniques that you can use to help diffuse, redirect and prevent these kinds of behaviors. 
In this scenario, Tracy is talking with the child, played here by 14-year-old Jenna, about transitioning to group time from individual playtime. In the past, she would sometimes shut down but would remain quiet and in the back of the group. But this past week has shown an escalation in her behaviors, as each time Jenna has faced this transition, she has reacted by getting aggressive. So let's take a closer look. Jenna, it's clean up time. We sang this song and now it's time to clean up. It's time to put the blocks away. Friends, it's time to clean up. Yep, let's thank you for putting blocks away. Jenna, I see you're still playing. I need you to put the blocks away. No, I won't clean up. It's time to clean up. We need to put the blocks away. You may be able to tell from Jenna's initial body language here that she's a little upset and pretty resistant to putting the blocks away. And you can see that when Tracy asks Jenna to put the blocks away, Jenna raises her voice and moves her arm as if to throw a block at Tracy. So when you get to this point with a child, you can't rewind it and try it again. You have to move forward. So how do you do that productively? We'll watch here as Tracy focuses on the relationship first as a way to diffuse the tense situation and move forward. I see you're getting upset. <sighs> Let's take a deep breath. Good work. All right. There's a lot of blocks out, aren't there? I bet you're feeling a little overwhelmed. So how about if I help you? I'll take care of the yellow ones and you take care of the blue ones and we'll work together. Does that sound good? Okay, thank you. So you can see here that Tracy gets down on Jenna's level, lowers her voice, and tries to connect with where Jenna is emotionally first, rather than immediately reinforcing the rules. She focuses on the relationship first to bring Jenna down from her peak of anger, then offers her help, and they put the blocks away together. Now, let's say through the power of movie magic, or by going through a wormhole that causes a Groundhog Day-like time loop, we could go back in time and try it all differently. So this time we see Tracy approach the situation a little bit differently before we hit the red alert battle stations phase. Hmm. I've noticed that cleanup time has really been difficult for Jenna lately, especially this past week. I wonder if I could try to do it differently. We have about three more minutes till cleanup time. I think I'm going to go over and try talking to her. It's going to be cleanup time pretty soon. I wanted to come and let you know so that we could help your body get ready for the transition. Okay, so I'll be back in a couple minutes and then we'll start cleaning up. All right. All right, Jenna, it's clean up time. Wow, what have you been building over here? I made a jail. You made a jail? Mm -hmm. Mean people go there and then they come back and then they're scary. So the mean people go to jail, but then they get back out and they're scary. That sounds really scary. Yeah. It looks like you've built this wall up so you can feel safe. Yeah. I wonder if we can work together to get these blocks put away, and if we get it done nice and quick, you can help me pick out the book for group time. Would you like to help me with that? Yeah. Okay. Would you like to knock it down, or should we just take it apart? Whoa! You exploded it! Nice work. How about if I start with the blue ones and you start with the yellow ones? So, as you can see, when we're working with children who have experienced a lot of trauma and stress, there are lots of different relationship-based kinds of techniques that you can use to really help diffuse the situation and help things go more smoothly. I'm wondering if you can reflect a little bit on um, the situation with the blocks and the transition from one activity to another. What do you think is going on there? Sometimes with kids who act out during transitions, sometimes it's because the work that they're doing is really fun mm -hmm. and they don't want to stop. Sometimes it's because um, they're acting out something traumatic related, a kind of a trauma-based play that they might be doing. And moving them out of it before they're finished can be really difficult for them to mm -hmm. transition out of. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that transitions often remind kids that they're not in control. And if you've had scary things happen or your world has been really unpredictable, you may have developed a strategy of trying to be in control in order to feel safe. And so then when teachers step in and are the boss type of thing, it can be really difficult for kids mm -hmm. to handle that. Mm -hmm. Well, and in this particular scenario, you saw Jenna use the blocks to kind of build up this the walls of the prison to kind of keep herself safe. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about the incarceration piece of, of that trauma play that we, we enacted here. Many kids have experienced a parent either being arrested in the middle of the night or their parent moving to a prison or all of a sudden being out of their life. Mm -hmm. 
and it's really confusing for them. They sometimes don't know what it is except for they see it in videos and movies or other people talk about it. And it's really difficult for them to make sense of, but that's my dad or my mom who I love, and how can they be a bad person or how can they have done something bad? Um, and that can be really overwhelming for kids. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's quite an honor if they're sharing it with you because that means that they feel safe enough with you to share that information. So hopefully it was helpful to see kind of what that might look like in action. Obviously, that was based in the classroom. And so thinking of it in the home setting um, might take a little bit of creativity. But typically what we see is kids get those big upsets. And if we can be proactive and um, do that relationship and connection based first, oftentimes we can invite kids into the relationship to manage a transition. Um, so the... Um, how do you help them handle it has some strategies for those fight behaviors or those aggressive type of behaviors um, that you might see from a child. And so hopefully you find that as a, a helpful resource as well. And now thinking about some trauma sensitive discipline tools. So hopefully adding some tools to your toolbox. Uh, many of us have had many experiences of being parented. So we are already coming with some tools. And this is a time where you get to refine your tools or maybe add some new ones to the box as well. So one of the first ones I like to talk about is when you're feeling furious, get curious, right? Stay calm no matter what. See the need behind the behavior. Meet that need. Find a way to meet that need and don't quit. Stick with it. Stick with this child because they're worth it, right? Um, so if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling with a kid, say, oh, what's going on here? What has happened? What's going on? Why are we feeling so upset? What's happening and getting in the way? Get curious. There's some attachment focused interventions like using a safety script, such as this is a safe place and I won't let anyone hurt you. So I can't let you hurt anyone else because this is a safe place, right? Back to that idea of felt safety. These safety scripts sometimes make it really clear what safety looks like and how we are maintaining it in this environment. This, this idea of connecting and correcting, um, making a statement that helps you connect with that child, stating the rule, suggesting an alternative, and thinking about win-win strategies that allow us to share control and gain something. Power struggles typically don't turn out well for any of us. So instead of getting into a power struggle, think about how we can work through it together instead. So this idea of connection before correction, right? When we can do this, we're letting the message of love come through. So if somebody needs to give you some feedback on how you're doing something, or if you made a mistake or upset somebody, typically we want them to say, I, I'm guessing you didn't mean it this way, or I know this wouldn't be normal for you to do, but this is what happened. Or I know you're usually really on top of these things, but this didn't seem to work out that way. That's this idea of connection before correction. And some other ways that this might look is this, I love you, but the answer is no. Or I can tell you really want to play with that toy, but we have to ask before we take it. So you can hear that idea of connection first and then the correction. So when we package it this way, typically kids are more able to hear it because the connection piece doesn't wake up their stress response system or the I'm in trouble part. It's just kind of like, hey, I care about you, but we have to do this, right? Um, so just thinking about ways that you can connect before you correct. So some other discipline tools that we can use, asking questions that help children reconsider their decisions. Being able to say like, oh, I noticed that your grade is looking like this or that your, your test score came back like this. Tell me, tell me what went behind how you chose to study or what was going on during the class time when this was happening or this is how this played out with a friend or a sibling um, and help them just kind of like rewind and go back and help you think, help them share what was going on in their mind when it was happening so that you can have insight, but also think about where could have it gone differently. Like we've mentioned before, this idea that behavior is telling you something. So try to get to the root of the problem. Um, if we don't get to the root, typically that behavior will show up in a different way. Maybe you have weekly meetings to talk about what's going on, especially with older kids. Sometimes it can be helpful to have a family meeting and just, just talk about what's working, what's not working, how can we all adjust, um, using redirection. So encouraging a child into something else um, as a way of distracting them from negative behaviors. Um, picking your battles, thinking about this idea of time in. I'm gonna share more about that in a moment. Um, naming their feelings and helping them work through the emotions of, with the situation. 
And then you can also track behaviors, maybe take note of how often they're happening, how frequently, what day, what time of the week it is, what time of the day it is, if it's more likely after school compared to bedtime, um, just to get more insight and information kind of goes back to that behavior thinking guide piece that can lead us then to a, a hypothesis, which can lead us to thinking about what do we want to do to support them and work through the behavior instead of just feeling overwhelmed by it or frustrated with it. Uh, so you meant, I heard you mention this idea as a time in. Um, so when we think, when we shift from thinking of time outs, which is what many of us have heard as, as you know, good discipline technique, um, it is much better than, than punitive things or, or punishment. Um, however, we also still need to be careful, especially with kids who have experienced some significant trauma, what a time out might mean to them or how it's been used in the past. So a time in is a little bit more like what we see happening in a sports game, for example. So if a, a football coach calls time out, what they're actually doing is a time in. They're saying, let's come together and think about this problem and see what we can do to fix it. They're not necessarily shunning that player and sending them away to go think about it and, and, and come back when they're ready. So a time in is really this idea of a collaborative problem solving, um, a collaborative come together and figure it out. Um, this views misbehavior as a mistake and might increase our supervision. It might be like, I see you're having a hard time keeping your hands to yourself. I'm just gonna stay by you so that we can help keep your hands making good choices today. Um, so it's a little bit more about using our proximity and engaging the child in relationships so that we can actually do correction right in the moment as things are happening. It takes a lot more energy as a caregiver to do it this way, but what we often find is that doing it this way for a while actually helps build that relationship and that connection with the child. It helps develop trust. It helps them learn that what safety is going to look like in this relationship, and it teaches them how to be in control of their bodies or in control of their words by having you there as a, as a regulatory partner as they're learning. So a kid's dysregulation is an opportunity to teach the child strategies for calming and thinking through, right? Um, we need an alternative. We need the child to use our regulation to help them calm down. So in these moments of time in, we're going to use fewer words. Try to make it 10 words or less when you make a statement to them. You might even think about words that are rhythmic or repetitive, like we're calming down. It's safe here. You're safe here, right? Real short statements, very calm sounding. Be aware of your tone of voice. Wait until the intensity comes down and then process it together, right? We don't, we don't learn anything when that we're in the midst of our upset or our big emotions. We learn after the calm has come. So there's some other examples here, some ther ther therapeutic language that we might use. Um, so these can be things like corrective comments, like you made a mistake. What can you do about it, right? Um, we love you, but we don't like what you did. Might be words about feelings, like I can understand how you feel and I'm sure you're going to handle it or I'm, I'm here to help you handle it. Door openers are ways to kind of open up conversation, like I'd be interested in your opinion about or I'd be interested in understanding what happened here, right? That seems really important to you. Freedom phase, phrases, sometimes Sometimes we do need to let kids make their own decisions. Sometimes we can let them make their own decisions. And so like you can decide that for yourself, right? Whether you want to eat that or not eat that, um, whether you can do that homework or not do that homework, um, you know, letting them know when there are opportunities for them to make those choices that you're okay with, you give them the freedom to do that. Phrases that might show confidence. Um, I'm sure you can straighten this out by yourself, but if you need help, you know where to find me. I think you can do it. If you keep working, you'll get it. Right, this idea that it kind of goes back to those encouragement statements that we were talking about earlier. Phrases that point out strengths and improvements. It looks like you really worked hard. You have improved in this. Look at how your grades are coming up in this. Um, I've noticed that you've stayed on top of your chores this week, right? Just noticing those strengths and improvements. And then phrases that show appreciation. We actually have a tendency to not show appreciation to kids as often as we might um, be able to. And so things like, thanks, that helped a lot, or it was thoughtful of you to do that, or you, you can help us by taking care of this or, or handling this specific thing. Um, so again, thinking about how we can give them that positive feedback when we see good things happening are ways that we can also um, just really build up and support children. And a lot of people ask me, well, what about consequences? A lot of what you've talked about has to do with our behavior. It has a lot to do with emotions and preventing behavior, but like, what about consequences? 
Like we don't, as adults, we don't get to do something and just get away with it. Like there's a consequence to those behaviors. And, and I agree. It's also important for us to remember that trauma also impacts a child's understanding of cause and effect. So you and I might understand that this behavior has this consequence. And therefore, if I don't want this consequence, don't engage in this behavior. But that actually requires a lot of mental and cognitive capacity to understand what this thing is and what my choices were in it and that it linked to this behavior. And so kids kids don't always have that understanding. So we sometimes need to keep in mind that what seems like a natural consequence to us might not be as naturally connected for a child. And then we might have to have conversations with them about what those things are. So natural consequences, these are one of the best teachers that we have. Um, these allow us to have an experience or have the result happen to behavior in a very natural way. Uh, these are ones that kind of happen without our, our intervention even, um, such as if you don't study for a test or get your homework done, your grade drops. Or if you go outside without a jacket on, you're going to be cold, right? If you don't put gas in the car, you're not going to be able to get to where you're going. Those are natural consequences. Um, they are things that happen as a result of doing or not doing something that has this reaction. So there are some times that we don't want to use natural consequences. Um, a logical one might work better, or we might have to get a little more strategic. So these would be obviously if there's a safety issue, or if there's something that might be dangerous for a child, such as the child is playing in the street and could get hit by a car. Like the natural consequence would be that they could get hurt and we don't want that to happen. So we're going to step in and help a child with that. Or these consequences might take too long, such as a bike that's left outside over time will rust and no longer work, um, but it's not going to be very immediate. Like it takes a long time for that to happen. So a natural consequence might not be as helpful there. Um, or when there's signs that the child actually just doesn't care. They might not care how dirty their room is. They might not care if they haven't taken a shower. They might not care if they haven't gotten their schoolwork done. Um, so if the child doesn't care about these things, then the natural consequence won't work because um, it, it won't matter to them. So it also has to be things that um, that are that matter to them in these situations. So if a natural consequence isn't going to work, then we can use something called a logical consequence. So a logical consequence are imposing consequences that are directly related as possible, as much as possible to the inappropriate behavior. They are ones that we might set ahead of time um, and in order to be effective, the logical connection between the behavior and the consequence must be apparent to the child. Um, it might be apparent to us sometimes, but not to them. So looking at it from their perspective and how old this child is and, and their understanding is important when we're thinking about logical consequences. So for example, if uh, Johnny broke a window, he might have to do some extra chores to earn the money to pay for that new window. Or if a child leaves their toys all over the place and doesn't pick them up, then the toys might get a timeout and have to take a break or go up on top of the fridge for a while. Um, or if a child hurts the feelings of another, they might have to participate in an apology of action, like writing a note or um, doing something friendly for that child. So if you make a big mess, you have to clean it up, right? Those are logical consequences. So if you can't do a natural one, a logical one is the next best teacher um, for, for with using with kids. Um, and remember, consequence is just a little tiny part of all of this conversation about discipline that we've been having today. Mistakes are opportunities to learn, right? Um, even as adults, when we make mistakes, we go, oh, what should have I done differently? What could I do differently next time to prevent this from happening? This is how we learn. This is how we learn to do things differently. And kids need opportunities to practice this as well. So when mistakes happen, not if, but when mistakes happen, we can ask the right questions, such as, what did you do? And then what happened? That's helping them make this if, um, connection between cause and effect too, right? So what did you do? What happened then? What could have you done differently? And are you willing to try that next time? Now, if this is a very young child, we might be summarizing those things for them rather than expecting them to answer those questions. Again, the right time to answer, ask these questions is when they're calm, not when they're upset, because it's hard to think when you're upset. And it's really hard to come up with like problem solving responses when you are upset. So thinking about this when they're in a calm state, when they're in a spot where you can ask these questions, um, and you might have to give them some ideas, like, what could have you done differently? They might be like, I don't know. You might be like, well, can we think about that together, right? Kind of inviting them into the conversation. So um, this helps them think about the behavior, explore possible alternatives, 
Um, and it's important that you guide the child's thinking without doing the thinking for them. So this is that learning piece comes from us supporting them and giving them as much help as they need to be successful, but not just doing it for them um, because that replaces some of the learning experience. And now we're gonna just talk a little bit about older kids. So if you have older kids in your care, um, it's important for us to just to slow down and, and think about what it might be like for them to come into this setting. So imagine for a second that you're a teenager and you have been taken away from your family and placed into this new home that's completely different than yours. There's new rules, there's new expectations, there's new routines. You're even expected to answer to a new parental figure who you don't even know. How might you react? What might be some of the things that you would be thinking and feeling? What would it take in order for you to develop trust with this new person? Imagine all the other things that you're thinking about too, like where your parent is and if they're okay or if they're safe. What's happening to the things at your home? What about the friends that you had in your neighborhood, right? Maybe the basketball team that you, haven't, that you can't play on now because you're in a different school. So really think about that for a second, right? What do these older kids need? So we need to find as adults the age appropriate ways to show nurture to these teens, right? Um, food can be a reliable source of comfort and nurture. So having regular meal times, maybe making their favorite foods, asking them to show you what some of the foods are that they used to make, um, especially if there's like cultural differences and maybe they're used to different food than you eat. Maybe even just thinking, what else, what would you like me to get from the grocery store next time I'm there? What are some of your favorite snacks, right? Those are ways that we show nurture and care for people, um, helping to, them to learn their own likes and dislikes. Sometimes we've had kids who have had some significant neglect and they actually don't know what their favorite flavor of ice cream is because they've never gotten to figure that out. Um, so really thinking about what their own dislikes and dislikes are might happen because they get to practice that with you. Um, helping them or involving them in the food preparation, um, teaching them some new skills. Um, I talk sometimes about this idea of shoulder to shoulder activities instead of face to face. And we find this, there's a little bit of a, a gender piece that goes into this too, but isn't always um, exactly that. But sometimes shoulder to shoulder activities um, are more often preferred by people who identify as male. Um, and they typically are activities like um, going for a walk, going to a sporting event or to a movie or doing things that are kind of side by side with the person. Whereas face to face might be like sitting at a coffee shop or having a meal together um, or something, you know, that's very much more intimate where you're kind of in this face to face place. So I jokingly say sometimes that that classic date of dinner and a movie, right? We have dinner, which is face to face. And then we have a movie, which is shoulder to shoulder. But thinking about with, with teens, especially, what might, what might this look like? So throwing a ball back and forth in the yard or playing catch is a way of doing a face-to-face -face activity without a ton of intimacy because there's some distance between you, but allows you to practice feeling in relationship, this back and forth that naturally happens in most conversations, right? Passing the ball back and forth is a natural, predictable way to practice that and allows us to be in relationship without it feeling super intimate um, at that moment. Shoulder to shoulder activities might also be cooking together or might be doing art together or something like that. So getting to know that child, but also thinking about, you know, what feels good to them in this relationship and what do they need from us? So it's also important to remember that um, these kids are also going through their typical developmental stages. Teenagers, whether they have are in foster care or not, are trying to figure out who I am, what are the boundaries, what are the expectations, right? Much like a toddler in some ways, but at the older version of it. And so some of what you're going to be experiencing them with them is also just typical development. So if it's been a while since you were a teenager or since you've raised a teenager, it might also be helpful for you just to spend some time uh, reviewing some of the teenage development and some of the things that teens might be practicing or trying to learn um, at this stage and how we can come along to support them. Um, great resources online. There's great webinars and podcasts on this out there as well. Um, books on this too. So if you're if you're doing um, foster care with teens, I highly recommend that you might need to seek out a little bit of extra support 
um, in order to do this um, effectively with them. One of the foster moms in the training in the past that I worked with said that um, sometimes when she had older teens in living with her, that going to school and people like, well, who are you living with, right? It's hard sometimes for a teenager to be like, oh, I'm in foster care. And so she would have a conversation with those older kids and say, you know, how, how about if I, if we act as an auntie and talked about like what aunties like might've looked like in their home growing up. Um, oftentimes we might have aunties or uncles that aren't biologically related, but take on that role in our lives. And so she would allow them to say that they were living with their auntie instead of like, I'm in foster care right now as a way for that teen to be able to kind of save some space, save face at school. Um, but also to, communicate to this child that I am not trying to replace your parent. I am trying to come alongside and support you in your growth and development, but not replace your mom or dad figure that you have had. Um, so it was also just a really respectful way of, of thinking about that with, um, with a teenage perspective. So some other tips for teens in foster care, take a step back, try and put yourself in their shoes. Think about what it's like to be them. Um, remember that adjustment takes time, right? They might have had many moves. They might have lived in a number of different homes already. They might have a number of people interfering with their lives. They might have court systems that are asking them to do all sorts of things. Um, they may have been expected to make a lot of changes in a very short period of time that they didn't ask for, right? Um, think about their age and their stage. What might they need at the age that they're at? Um, I also recommend thinking about um, asking if they were involved in any sports or extracurricular activities in their school. Um, I had a mom tell me one time that the school had reached out to her and said, hey, isn't Joey going to be playing basketball this season? And she was like, I didn't even know that Joey played basketball. And when she asked Joey about it, Joey said, well, I, I didn't I didn't know because I don't have my shoes here. I don't have my my uniform here. I don't have anything that I can use to go play. And so foster mom was able to advocate for getting those things from the child's home um, and got them going and, and set up so they could go to practice and things. Um, so ask them about those activities that they might be in and if they want to continue in them and what resources they might need to make that happen. Um, be, par be patient, right? Every family is different and yours are going to be very different to them compared to their birth family. So think about too, like, oh, this thing that I'm frustrated about, or I want to have changed, like, is this still going to be a major issue in a few weeks from now? Because if it's not, then maybe it's not worth taking the time to, to address it right now, right? Um, and also don't expect for them to be grateful for this home um, and the welcome that you give them. This is really daunting for them. Um, they might be dealing with grief. They might be dealing with loss. Um, they might be dealing with a lot of things. And so you might think like, oh my gosh, I'm bringing in them into this home. It's going to be safe. They're going to have food. They're going to have connected adults. And they might be like, I don't really care right now. Right. Um, so not because they're ungrateful, not because they're trying to be mean, but because they've gone through a lot. So give them a chance to, to work through some of that and be there with them and maybe even name some of that to them and let them know. I, I can imagine it might be feeling this way um, and let them speak into that and help you understand what it's like from their perspective. So we are coming to the end of our time together today. Um, I want to say thank you to you. Um, I hope that the, the conversation today and that the videos and that the handouts are a good resource for you. We have just barely scratched the beginning of what discipline might look like and might mean. Um, I highly recommend that if you have a child who's working with a therapist, that you talk with that therapist or counselor about what they recommend for discipline strategies. They're going to be able to help you take in mind the experience that this child has had and what unique strategies they might need. Um, they also might be able to help you take into consideration the developmental age of the child. So you might have a child who is looking and walking like a 10 year old, but developmentally because of their trauma or learning disabilities might function more like a three or four year old. And so we're gonna have to adjust expectations um, down to what their capacity is for them to handle. So if they're working with a school counselor or a therapist or um, other resources, make sure you connect with them and, and ask some questions um, about how you might be able to be the best support for this child as they're in your care. So. A little quote here, as foster parents, we are asked to not only care for the basic needs of the child, but also to sit alongside them as they digest the hurt and the damage they have undeservingly experienced.
So thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your care and consideration. Remind yourself often why you chose to do this because there's going to be days that it's going to be really hard and make sure that you get the extra support that you need and as you're doing this as well. Thank you very much.